Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Rizuka, and I'm a senior research associate in the Department of Mental Health and deputy director of the Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse here at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the final discussion in our three-part series, Conversations on the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse. This Hopkins at Home series, sponsored by the Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse and the JHU Alumni Relations Office of Lifelong Learning has highlighted some of the novel approaches the Moore Center team has taken over the past decade to end child sexual abuse. Today's conversation, Help Wanted, Helping People Stay Safe, will focus on a prevention intervention that is very near and dear to our hearts, the Help Wanted Prevention Intervention. Help Wanted is an innovative online self-help course that provides strategies and resources to people with a sexual attraction to children to support their well-being and commitment to keep children safe. Our conversation will include a live Q&A, and we encourage you to participate by placing your questions and comments in the chat feature below. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce my friend, colleague, and co-presenter, Dr. Ryan Shields. Ryan is an assistant professor in the School of Criminology and Justice Studies at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Prior to joining UMass Lowell, he was an assistant scientist and associate director here at the Moore Center. He is also co-developer of the Help Wanted Prevention Intervention and the face of the Help Wanted Prevention Intervention um, when he visited the site. So Ryan, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Amanda. I'm happy to be here. At the Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse, our mission is to prevent children from ever experiencing sexual harm. And one of the primary ways we strive to achieve this goal is by examining factors that may increase a person's risk of engaging in child sexual abuse and providing them with effective strategies to mitigate those risk factors and in turn keep children safe. This perpetration prevention approach has proven successful with other types of child victimization including things like child physical abuse, bullying, and child neglect, but it has not been widely used to address child sexual abuse. So upon launching our center 10 years ago, our team began developing a prevention intervention for a population that we often don't talk about when we talk about prevention, people with a sexual attraction to children. We know that a sexual attraction to children is a clear risk factor for child sexual abuse perpetration, but there are few resources available that directly address having a sexual attraction to children. The lack of available resources is likely due to our society's views that people with a sexual, sexual attraction to children are unpredictable and uncontrollable monsters who are destined to harm a child because they either cannot be helped or are unwilling to get help. But these assumptions are simply not true. And that, quite frankly, they stand in the way of prevention. Many people with a sexual attraction to children never harm a child and often seek support and resources in coping with their attraction and the stigma surrounding it. So clearly we have a population of people who are not destined to offend and are seeking help and support but cannot find any. To address this lack of resources, we wanted to develop an intervention that not only aimed to prevent child sexual abuse, but also aim to reduce the psychological stressors such as loneliness, anxiety, or depression that those seeking help might face. Our team developed a four-phase approach to create help wanting. First, we conducted interviews with people living with but not acting on a sexual attraction to children to better understand the challenges that they face, the type of resources that they're looking for, and the type of support that they are seeking. In phase two, we developed intervention content to address these needs. And in phase three, we obtained feedback on that intervention content from help seekers themselves to make sure that the content that we developed sufficiently addressed their needs. To date, we have completed phases one through three of this project and are currently working on phase four, 
conducting a study to evaluate the effectiveness of Help Wanted. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan to share some details about our interviews in phase one and our intervention content. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. So as Amanda mentioned, we knew that we wanted to begin this project by getting a better understanding of the experiences and the needs of our key population of people who are attracted to children. So to do this, we conducted a series of interviews with 30 individuals who are attracted to children, 30 young adults between the ages of 18 to 30. And we asked them essentially, when did you know that you were attracted to children? How did you react? Did you tell anyone? Did you ask for any help? And what would have been helpful to you had it been available? And in analyzing that qualitative data, what we found was that there's sort of some common experiences. The first of which is that they began to recognize their attraction to children in adolescence. Often they lacked the vocabulary of associating that with um, pedophilia or minor attraction, but rather they recognized that the people that they were attracted to was not the same as the people that their friends were attracted to. Or as they got older, the age gap between um, who they were attracted to and themselves, you know, that got bigger too. And as they went into late teens and early adulthood, that's when the, the full meaning of their attraction really, um, uh, really came in, in full force. And as you could expect, um, that was met with a lot of fear, fear about what does this mean for the future um, or hopelessness or isolation. Um, really sort of uh, managing these um, pretty complex negative um, uh, experiences and reactions. What was interesting was that the majority of the people that we talked to said that was what they needed help dealing with, not necessarily keeping themselves from acting on their attraction. Um, of course, they recognized that some people might not be in that position, but felt very confident um, that they um, were not at risk of, of uh, harming a child, that they knew that was wrong. They weren't going to do that. But what they needed <clears throat> was support in just navigating young adulthood, navigating life um, with, uh, sort of with this attraction, what that, what that means for their future. Um, to the extent that they looked for help, they found very little. In fact, with the dominant messages that they really were confronted um, were two. And the first was this monster frame that, um, that you're a monster, that you're destined to hurt a child, that you're destined for jail. Um, or they also confronted messages that were dismissive about child sexual abuse. Both of these dominant messages are harmful. They do nothing for prevention and they don't do anything to support people. Um, many of the people that we spoke to really discussed uh, trying to wrestle with um, how to get formal help through, through therapy. And, and for some people, they were able to find providers and, um, and had a great experience. And that was a, a really important part of their process, right, of their healing. Um, some had experiences with providers that were not positive. Uh, in one example, an individual told me that their provider said, oh, we can't talk about this. We're here to talk about your depression, not your attraction, um, which you know just shuts down the conversation is, is, is pretty unfortunate. And then there were some people who never sought formal um, therapy because they were afraid just by mentioning their thoughts or their attraction that that in and of itself was um, reportable or that they could get in trouble for that. And so really unsure about how to access good help. Uh, the thing that everybody mentioned was the importance of this online community. So people um, found self-help uh, groups, support groups, um, uh, uh, made up of people who are attracted to children and committed to not engaging in that attraction and providing support for each other. And that this online community was really important because they could be remain you know, confidential and anonymous, um, but start to have conversations around how to, um, how to support themselves and, and how to try and pursue a, a happy and healthy life. So we knew that if we wanted to design an intervention uh, for this group of people, um, that we it needed to address these things. It needed to provide some background on, on um, an attraction to children and child sexual abuse. It needed to deal with some of those psychological stressors, deal with the isolation, the stigma, the hopelessness, that the resources had to be sound, and that it had to exist in an online space, right, to meet people where they are. So, in phase two, we took what we learned from the interviews and set forward to build the intervention. 
And so our uh, the director of the Moore Center, Elizabeth Letourneau, assembled a team of experts, experts in child sexual abuse, in treatment, in prevention in law enforcement um, to gather together, examine the uh, findings from the interviews that we conducted and really start to identify what are the key areas of focus. And it was really cool because we met in person, had poster, you know, paper on the on the wall and we brainstormed, we wrote out ideas. It was this really creative brainstorming process. And in doing so, we identified the major five areas that we wanted to target um, with specific intervention modules or what we call sessions. And so after that, we, um, uh, Amanda and I led the um, development, the drafting of the content. So we started scripting for each session. You know, what is it that we wanted to say? What kind of information did we want to provide? What did we want to do with that session? Um, with the completion of the scripts, we then collaborated with 3C Institute. 3C Institute is um, a company that um, designs and hosts online mental health uh, interventions. And so they collaborated with us to take what we drafted and edit it to make sure that the messages were accessible, on target, um, uh, uh, short, uh, you know, uh, really kind of like powerful key communication. Um, they also designed the visual and interactive elements um, and uh, facilitated the filming for each session. So after uh, a lot of work, <laughs> a ton of work, lots of revision, we have a final product. Um, and uh, what you're seeing on your screen now um, is found on the homepage. So on helpwantedprevention.org, uh, uh, people who come to our site, we call um, uh, we call this group help seekers. So help seekers come to our homepage. And what they're presented with is um, a, a display of our core values. So the things that we wanted to build throughout the entire intervention to make sure that we had the sort of common, clear value system. And, and here are the values. One, you are not defined by your attraction. You deserve good health and happiness. You can help keep children safe from being harmed. And you are not alone. So these are our, our four values that we really kind of kept at the, the front of our mind as we were building out the intervention and that we wanted to demonstrate that this is a positive sort of supportive experience. So uh, now what you are seeing is essentially the, um, the session uh, training course. And so what I'll do is just briefly talk about our five core sessions and then show off some of the features. Uh, and so listed on the left side are the five sessions. Now, help seekers can access these in any order. I'll describe them sequentially, but people can access them in sort of any uh, order that they wish. The first session is what is child sexual abuse? And so with this session, we really wanted to provide that, that foundational education about child sexual abuse, explaining what it is, explaining why it's not only illegal, but also harmful, giving some people some tools and resources if they are at all concerned about their thoughts or behaviors, and then also bringing in the experiences of people who have um, survived child sexual abuse, so bringing in the survivor perspective and hearing from their stories to get a better, well-rounded understanding of child sexual abuse. In the next session, telling someone about your attraction, what we're trying to do is really improve people's decision-making about whether or not to tell someone else about their attraction. And we don't uh, take a stance. Um, there's reasons to tell people and there's reasons not to tell people, good reasons. And uh, what we want is for people to really give a thoughtful, you know, the who, what, why, when, and how of disclosure so that they're able to make an informed decision about whether they should tell someone about their attraction. In the next session, coping with your sexual attraction, um, this session is really around what to do um, with um, when you're experiencing sexual thoughts about children, what to do when you are experiencing some distress uh, because of those psychological stressors that we talked about. Um, how do you na navigate that? How do you manage that? And so what we did was develop some right now strategies and some long-term strategies. So right now in the moment, what can be done to deal with, to deal with these feelings? Um, and then also what can be done for the long term? How do you build in some, some habits, some daily practices that make that just a part of your, your toolkit? Again, trying to build up the resources uh, for people who are attracted to children. In the fourth session, um, building a positive self-image, it was really important for us to think about 
countering some of these really negative messages about uh, people who are attracted to children and to get people to think sort of about themselves beyond who they're attracted to. That's one characteristic of their of their self, one characteristic among many. And so thinking about yourself in sort of a strengths-based kind of way, what, what is it that I like about myself? What do I do really well? Um, we have practicing, uh, you know, positive I statements, which are good for good for anyone, uh, essentially. But how do we build up that positive sense of self um, that is so important um, as people, you know, deal with challenging, challenging things that come up? And then finally, in our fifth session, we wanted to um, provide uh, information around building a healthy sexuality to get people to view sexuality beyond sort of just sexual contact, which for this population can never happen. So how do we build up some of the other elements um, uh, uh, of a healthy sexuality? How do we build up intimacy with same-aged peers? How do we focus on different um, uh, components of a healthy sexuality? We wanted our information to be delivered in a really engaging way. And so um, we've used 3C Institute's tell me, show me, let me try approach. Tell me is essentially that didactic sort of lecture content. Um, show me our uh, vi um, videos or demonstrations of a skill or practice in action. And let me try offers help seekers the opportunity to practice some of the things that we've um, we presented to them. And so uh, now I'll just um, quickly uh, go through some of the uh, some of the sessions and what they feature. Um, for uh, what is child sexual abuse? Again, this was we wanted to provide some foundational education. So 3C um, built this sort of interactive dictionary so people can click on a key term, see the definition, they can hear the definition read again to kind of get a better understanding of some of these terms that we use. In our telling someone about your attraction, we present three different scenarios and using a drag and drop interactive, help seekers are able to select, you know, when would I share this or who would I share this piece of information with? Um, and they can drag it over and then they get automatic, uh, automated feedback from those decisions. In uh, our uh, coping with your sexual attraction session, um, we have our right now uh, strategies. And so this is, again, um, they're in the moment, they're, they're having some feelings and they need some help. They can go to these short videos and see um, a skill or a resource or practice in action. So for example, uh, the take some deep breaths. This is a mindful breathing, <clears throat> excuse me, mindful breathing exercise. And it goes through how to do that, how to do deep breathing. And there's an animation that inhales and exhales to the time of how we should be how we should be doing that, that deep breathing to again, demonstrate that key skill. In our um, next session, building a positive self-image, remember this was the um, trying to deal, counter some of those harmful messages, building up some positive views of oneself. And so what we did was we interviewed um, uh, adults who are attracted to children, who are happy, healthy, um, have not acted on their attraction. And they really are talking about their experience, how they, work to find happiness or you know what they do daily to to keep themselves feeling good and it's really interesting because one of the things that we learned from our interviews was that there are no visible role models for this community right because anyone that they see sort of in the media is someone who is being arrested or or has been you know charged with with harming children and they never saw the people succeeding. And so we wanted to provide that. And so very generously, people shared their stories and we transcribed them and hired voice actors you know, to keep people's um, confidentiality uh, in check. And so um, we present these stories, these are true stories about what people are doing daily. And, and they're very fascinating. You know, it's not overly, um, it's real. It's not overly you know, Pollyanna about things. They talk about their struggles, but also talk about how they feel you know, better now that they've kind of been able to process this information. And then in um, building a healthy sexuality, again, we're trying to get people to think about sexuality um, sort of beyond just their sexual attraction. So we have information there, but then we also have videos and resources on topics related, you know, to, to um, a healthy sexuality. And they can kind of choose what they want to learn about, whether that's giving consent or practicing safe sex. They're able to do a, a deeper dive on, on different topics and, and learn a bit more through, through videos and resources. And in addition to our five 
uh, core sessions, we also have a pretty extensive resource page. Um, we have links to organizations and websites that would be able to provide additional support. We also have links to content that was found within the intervention that and you're able to filter by the session. So help seekers are able to access um, some of those resources immediately without having to you know click through the intervention again. They can have sort of a, a full, um, full access to those resources. And then we also have um, decided to transcribe uh, the, the full intervention. Um, we have PDFs available in five languages. So we've transcribed them in Arabic, Chinese, English, Hindi, and Spanish. And so those are, are currently available as well. Um, and so in addition, so we have our five sessions and then a pretty extensive resource page to provide people support. Uh, so with that, I will pass over to Amanda. Amanda is going to talk about phase uh, three and four of our evaluation, or excuse me, of our intervention. Thank you, Ryan. So in phase three, we gathered feedback on Help Wanted through a series of interviews and also through anonymous surveys that we have hosted at the end of each of our five Help Wanted course sessions. And we wanted to see if the material and the content that we created actually was responsive to those needs and the, the supports that we identified through those interviews with people seeking help. And Help seekers were asked throughout these interviews and also in the surveys to share with us what works. And that means like what they like and find helpful about the course. What did they like about the content? What did they like about the tone? How about our approach to the subject? And what could we improve? So we received feedback from over 650 people and combed through all that feedback and overall found that people like the way that the Help Wanted site and content emphasizes the humanity of those seeking help. People liked the course design and felt that the content was clear and encouraged them to engage in self-reflection. Others liked the positive tone throughout the course. And so for example, in summarizing the overall tone of Help Wanted, one person said that they felt the intervention sent the message that you matter and you can figure this out. Another person said that hope underlies the entire thing. Another important piece of feedback we received is that steps that we had taken to ensure the confidentiality of those who visit the site, such as not tracking IP addresses, for example, felt legitimate to those searching the site. Feedback we received on what needs work centered around requests for more information and content for people exclusively attracted to children. Additional explanations about why child sex sexual exploitation materials such as child pornography are harmful, and requests for more concrete examples of coping strategies that people could use, as well as additional content on how fantasies could be helpful or not helpful. So to address these requests, we've added content throughout each of the sessions. Additional content, for example, was built into the Building a Healthy Sexuality session for people who are exclusively attracted to children. And there's also a portion in that session that helps guide people through the role of fantasies in their lives. Are they helpful or are they potentially harmful? We've also added content to the Coping with Your Sexual Attraction session with more examples and coping strategies that people can engage in if needed. And we also included an additional session on how connecting with others might be helpful as a coping strategy. In phase four, thanks to funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, we are currently working on a large evaluation of Help Wanted to determine not only the effectiveness of the intervention in preventing child sexual abuse, but also its impact in reducing those psychological stressors that help seekers may experience. This evaluation will also help us to identify additional ways that we might be able to further revise Help Wanted to reach and meet the needs of more help seekers. And this project will result in an updated version of the intervention that will incorporate all of these different revisions. So in May, 2020, with funding from the Oak Foundation, we released a beta version of Help Wanted online to the general public. And this has led to several major accomplishments and next steps for the Help Wanted intervention. In just three weeks after releasing it, we had over 2,000 visits to the site and had been contacted by help seekers, colleagues, victims advocates, big tech, 
and international organizations all offering positive feedback and wanting to help support and promote Help Wanted. This support has taken many forms. Organizations including Meta and Google feature Help Wanted on their resource pages. Google also includes a link to Help Wanted in a Google One box. And, and this is a box that pops up when people search particular terms that may lead them towards child sexual abuse or exploitation materials. Meta also supported the promotion of Help Wanted across their platforms by using ads like the Facebook ad featured here. And this particular ad has been featured in several ad campaigns throughout the United States, United Arab Emirates, France, Hong Kong, India, and Mexico, and has been viewed over 3 million times. Thanks to the support from all of these groups and individuals, we have had nearly 515,000 visits to the Help Wanted site to date. And we have also received requests to adapt Help Wanted for other languages and cultures, and are currently, thanks to funding from Google, working with partners in Mexico to do a full language and cultural adaptation of Help Wanted for Mexico. And since the beginning, when we started developing Help Wanted, our team was also receiving requests for help from people who had had someone disclose an attraction to them, but weren't sure how to react or where to guide people or how to best support them. And most of these people were family members, friends, and professionals like treatment providers, religious advisors, school personnel, or medical providers. And so we decided to create some additional content to help answer these questions for folks. And we did this in a way that aligns with the same methods we used to develop the first five sessions of Help Wanted. So we reached out to these folks and asked them questions. You know, what were their reactions when someone disclosed an attraction to children to them? And what did they find helpful out there, if anything, resource-wise? Are there new resources that they would like to see or additional information that they would like available that they think would be helpful to them at this point and also to others who haven't had but may have someone disclose an attraction to them. And so we've developed two resources, the, fan, the friends and family resources include general information about having an attraction to children, ways that they can be supportive if someone discloses an attraction to them, and how after that initial disclosure, they can continue the conversation with their loved one um, to make sure that they're continually checking in and providing support. And we also included tips for processing their own feelings as a caretaker and making sure they're also getting the self-care that they themselves need. The professional session is targeted to all kinds of treatment providers. So, you know, those medical professionals, mental health professionals, et cetera. And we wanted to make sure no matter who they were, if someone disclosed an attraction to them, they had a good understanding of the professional codes of ethics and limits to confidentiality, as well as what best practices they could use when working with someone with an attraction to children. And so these additional sessions are created, but not currently available on the Help Wanted site, but will be in the near future. So I'm sure Ryan and I could spend another hour talking about Help Wanted, but I would love to make sure that we save some time to open things up to the audience for our Q&A portion of the program. But before I do, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge all of the funders who have made Help Wanted possible and whose support allows us to continue to grow and adapt the intervention to reach even more help seekers. If you're interested in checking out Help Wanted, I encourage you to go to our site at helpwantedprevention.org. And now I'll turn it over to Ryan to kick off our Q&A session. Thank you, Amanda. And I want to encourage everyone, if you are with us live, feel free to put your questions in the chat box and we'll try to get to as, as many as we can. Um, Amanda, just to maybe start things off, uh, for you, what has been the most you know, surprising or exciting part about working on, on the Help Wanted uh, Prevention and Intervention for you? Yeah, so the entire journey, quite honestly, from the very beginning when we started talking about just what would we have to do to develop this intervention has been very exciting. And I think the most surprising and, and exciting thing would be all of the support and collaborations that we received throughout this process. Um, as we mentioned throughout this 
presentation, you know, we've had support from law enforcement, from survivors, from advocates, from people with sexual attraction to children themselves, um, treatment providers, and big tech, for example, and all of their support, promotion, and, and contributions to this work has just been amazing. And really, quite frankly, um, is why Help Wanted has been so successful and reached so many people. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree that we've been working on this since 2013. Is that, is that, am I, yes. am I yeah, correctly? Yeah, 2013. And for so long, it was very um, abstract. We were working on, on building on, on trying to understand what the needs were. And so now that it's um, a beta version is out, released into the world and, and seeing the concrete example, it's just been really um, exciting to see all of our hard work and all of our collaborations with with experts and with um, the people who are attracted to children, with families and 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 professional, it's just been really exciting to see um, uh, to see it all come to fruition. Um, okay, so I'm going to look into some questions. Um, Tina wanted to know how do we access um, the help wanted resources um, and specifically like around the videos and the content that we made. Yeah, so Tina, those are available at the site, um, which is hopefully still on the screen for you, helpwantedprevention.org, and we can certainly make sure that's put in the chat box for you as well. And on there, at the top of the screen, once you get to the site, there's a tab for resources, and you can go find it a full list of all of our resources, as well as filter by the different sessions to kind of hone in on the specific content that you're looking for. Yeah, and just to re reiterate, anyone can go visit Help Wanted Prevention. Um, it's it's free, it's accessible. Um, uh, uh, you know, anyone is able to access those those resources. Um, Cindy um, asked, this was a really interesting question, is this online prevention resource unique? Are there similar resources available? Um, did we um, take any lessons learned from, you know, what was already existing to build Help Wanted? Um, Amanda, what do you uh, what do you think about that? So yeah, I would say that there are some now. When we began, there were very few similar resources available or any resources at all. Um, in the past ten years, it's been wonderful to see other resources becoming available. Um, some specific to certain countries um, and not just the U.S., but some that that reach internationally as well. And our intervention is somewhat unique in that we've developed our content to definitely attract people who are not only adults dealing with an attraction to children, but also some of those young people as well who may be first becoming aware of their attraction and, and may still be trying to figure out, like, do I actually have an attraction to children or, you know, what's going on and just trying to get some information and feel some support. And um, some of the resources out there have, you know, live chats with mental health professionals. Um, some are, you know, more treatment focused where people, you know, answer some a set of questions and then get assigned to certain content that they should go through. Um, and so ours is just open and people can can come in and come back as much as they like. Um, Brian, I don't know if you want to expand upon. Yeah, no, I mean, it, you're, you're absolutely your right. Yeah, we're absolutely right. We um, when we started, there was very little, and now there's more, um, which is exciting. I mean, that I mean, I think that is um, representing at least in part a shift in the way that we're thinking about um, about these these issues, and the fact that there are more resources today than ten years ago is 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 just it's a win. It goes into the power of changing minds about prevention and how we think about prevention and how we think about addressing people's um, behavior and treating people like people. I mean, it, to me, all of that is, is positive. Um, there's not enough. So, certainly, I mean, from based on the uh, the past two presentations, we learned there's so much work happening, but so many other places that we could go. Um, and so that's the, that's sort of like the exciting bit of opportunity um, for, for us as a field. We've come a long way, but still, uh, uh, still places to go. Um, Joe wanted to know uh, if our um, intervention has been translated into in-person sessions or is, does it really like the confidentiality or anonymity of the internet, does that sort of like allow this to, to happen? Um, and I will say um, one, so we haven't translated into in-person interventions like through our own development. 
Um, I was doing a, a conference um, a few weeks ago and it was with a treatment provider and um, that treatment provider said that they use elements of help wanted in treatment with their young clients. And specifically they used the um, child sexual abuse um, survivor stories. And so just to reiterate, we interviewed people who had experienced child sexual abuse and they very generously um, you know, gave us their time and their stories. And we transcribed those interviews and recorded them with voice actors and then feature that in our What is Child Sexual Abuse session. And so um, the treatment provider was saying that, that he used it um, with his clients to learn about the perspective of someone who's experienced um, uh, child sexual abuse and found it found it very helpful. And so I've also heard from other providers that they have used different pieces, um, but we haven't uh, developed, you know, on our end, uh, uh, an in-person version of this. It exists online for, for the reason, Joe, that you mentioned, the anonymity of the internet allows people to access this information in a safe way when they can, you know, when, they're, when they have free time, when they're alone, they're able to, to access this information. Um, all right, let's see. Amanda, could you talk a little bit more about um, where we see Help Wanted going? The you know uh, in terms of future directions of Help Wanted, um, you mentioned that a little bit in the um, in the previous slides. But is you know where where do you see Help Wanted uh, going in the future? Absolutely, Ryan. Um, so after we complete our evaluation study of Help Wanted, we will take a close look at you know what are some things that we can improve about it? Um, what are our outcomes look at like, and, and can we add any sessions to help wanted to really better address the needs of those seeking help and improve our outcomes? And so we'll do that and then launch a brand new version of Help Wanted online um, to the general public. And with that, I certainly see we've had so many people reach out asking for Help Wanted to be translated into other languages and, and cultures. And we do have the transcripts on our website right now, but they are by no means, you know, adapted for culture. They are translations that, you know, have been gone over with someone, you know, who um, is fluent in that language and also has background in understanding this topic area, but is not adapted for culture. And so once we complete our adaptation for Mexico, we'll have this lovely model down and, you know, we'll be able to much faster translate help one into other languages and cultures as well. We really, really want this to be a resource that's accessible to people worldwide. Excellent, thanks Amanda. And Amanda, you actually answered uh, a question that Maggie posed around the adaptation. So th thank you for, for doing that. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's see, um, Tony uh, asks, oh, this is a great question, Tony. Okay, so Tony says, what about adolescents who have a sexual attraction to children? Uh, will be um, would this version of help wanted be appropriate for them, or is there something specific to adolescents with an attraction to children? And so um, I, I think, I mean, I can uh, speak to this. Um, I think um, when we um, began thinking about help wanted, we thought about it in terms of like being directed towards younger people, towards adolescents, because of that finding that um, people were recognizing their attraction in adolescents. Um, what we learned through our interviews is that that's a, it's a slow period of realization, and sometimes they um, uh, don't make sort of the full connection until later teens or young adulthood. So what we decided to do was, you know, Help Wanted is, is pretty broad in terms of its um, uh, uh, perspective. And so there's some information in there. So I'm thinking of uh, the healthy sexuality session that might be super helpful for younger or so adolescents and teens um, more helpful for, for that group than, say, uh, adults um, who may already be familiar with some of the content. And then some of our intervention content would be new for everyone. So we took kind of like a broad approach that sort of anyone who um, is interested in, and needs help um, uh, can obviously visit Help Wanted, but really kind of focusing on um, adolescents, older adolescents, and young adults as sort of our, our tar target population. Um, and again, uh, recognizing that you know, we've heard from the previous slides that um, you know, children, other children account for um, a large proportion of cases of child sexual abuse, up to about 70%, the statistic says. Um, most of those, the vast majority of those cases are not due to a, a sexual interest in, in children. Um, when we look at prevalence statistics, we see um, in the adult male population, about one to 3% 
having pedophilia. Um, we don't have good estimates of uh, sexual attraction to children in uh, adolescent population. Um, and so, and we, you know, we use the term uh, attraction to children, sexual attraction to children, rather than pedophilia pedophilia, because pedophilia is a, a clinical diagnosis, essentially, and we want to go broader and be more inclusive. Um, and so though uh, the vast majority of um, kids who engage in harmful sexual behavior, it's not due to sexual interest in children, um, there may be a proportion that is, and, and we just don't have good estimates uh, about that. Um, Amanda, is anything um, there that you wanted to um, fill in the gaps, anything I left out? Yeah, I would just add that we worked very closely with Reese Institute, um, who developed the site to make sure that our language was written in such a way that it would be appropriate for that young adolescent, young adult population, as well as an adult population. And it's one of the reasons we went with the model of the tell me, show me, let me try to make sure there were several learning modalities so that people, you know, could try out the content. And again, it would be applicable to those different populations and age groups. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Laura has a question. Um, and I just scrolled past it. One second. There we go. Uh, so Laura was asking, you know, when we're talking about help wanted, what framing has been useful or helpful in terms of how we present help wanted, how we talk about it? What kinds of key messages and frames um, do you find, Amanda, uh, helpful in this regard? Yeah, so going back to when Ryan talked about our core values, that's that's really the framing that we have used to talk about Help Wanted is that everyone deserves help and happiness and everyone deserves the resources to live their best life and you matter. And so we've really been reaching out to folks um, using that framing and, and Help Wanted is really set up as a primary prevention program. And so, you know, there are other programs out there for people who have already engaged in child sexual abuse and, and are in treatment and um, programs to, to help promote them not reoffending, right? Um, and so Help Wanted is really designed with the approach that, you know, there is a group of people out there who don't have any resources, who, you know, have not offended, who don't have a desire to offend and really need some support and resources around having this attraction. And so um, that's where help wanted, I think really fits yeah. in expression. One of the things that I've learned in the process of doing this work, you know, um, language is really important and it changes fast. For example, when we first started back in, you know, 2013, um, the phrase non-offending pedophile was used by, um, by this population. That's one of the labels that they use to identify themselves. And um, they've moved away from that. And it's interesting because you sort of non-offending pedophile um, so inherent in that is the assumption of offending, like not offending is the qualifier. Um, and so one of the things that I found really valuable is in the 650 plus, um, uh, 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 co you know, comments that we received, um, a lot of people talked about the language throughout the intervention, got us to think about, you know, what is, what are the inherent assumptions that we're making, um, about, uh, uh, about populations by the language that we use. And so a lot's changed in, in 10 years. And I think being really thoughtful about the terminology we use, um, about how we frame things is really important. And I will say, you know, I've talked about Help Wanted, you know, hundreds of times um, and really demonstrating the core values and the humanity of people, um, I think goes a long way that we're talking about people. We're talking about supporting people who are asking for help. And I think we can all agree that that's, that's a good thing. Um, so I think um, that is that is it for in terms of time for questions. Um, uh, Amanda, so back to you. Yes, and um, I think that gives me the perfect opportunity to put a plug in for all of those who did not see last week's conversation from Rebecca Fix, who talks about a study that we are doing all around how we talk about child sexual abuse prevention. So um, please go back and check that out if you didn't see it and want some more information about that language piece that Ryan was just touching on. So um, sadly, we're out of time, but I would like to once again, thank Ryan for his generosity and coming and sharing his time with us today to discuss Help Wanted. I would also like to thank all of you for attending and joining us not only today, but throughout this series over the last few weeks. 
Our work at the Moore Center depends on the generosity of our donors, and we welcome you to consider supporting our center in our work to keep children safe. A follow-up email will be shared with you that will include links to all three of our conversations in this series, as well as a schedule of other upcoming virtual and in-person events. We hope to see you soon at future Moore Center and Hopkins at Home events. Have a great afternoon.